We're sitting inside a jet flight simulator for the 727 with a complete cockpit, including all the instruments for three crew members and the instructors. I'm in the seat of the co-pilot or first officer. Behind me here would be the flight engineer or second officer. And here in the captain's seat is one of the flight instructors, Don McGann. Don, the pilot gets all the sensations of a real flight here in the cockpit of this simulator, doesn't he? That's right, Bill. Let me show you what it feels like. For instance, this is a captain's flight instrument panel with such things as the airspeed indicator, the compass, and the altimeter. On your side of the airplane, you have an exact duplicate of my flight instruments. Right. And in the center, there's one set of instruments for engine readings. To the right of that is the gear handle, which controls raising and lowering of the gear. Here are the throttles for the three jet engines. And on this pedestal between us are the radio controls. On the overhead panel, there are various lighting switches, hydraulic switches, and other electrical switches. The hydraulic system on this airplane controls the landing gear, the brakes, the wing flaps, and the flight controls. We have two separate and distinct hydraulic systems, just in case one should not function properly. In addition to that, we have a standby system which is powered electrically. So by watching just a few of these instruments, I can pretty well follow the basic maneuvers of the airplane. That's right, Bill. To go faster, we'd advance the throttles like this. And you'd see the engine thrust increasing on these instruments. You can also observe our airspeed increase on the indicated airspeed. That airspeed indicator is something like the uh, speedometer in my car, then. That's right, Bill. To slow down, we decrease <coughs> throttle position. You can note the airspeed decay on your instrument. Also, if we want to slow down more quickly, we can extend our speed brakes, which are on top of the wings, by bringing this handle to the rear. Now, notice how quickly your airspeed is decaying. Oh, yes. Yeah. What's this instrument here? Bill, that's the gyro horizon. It's probably the most important flight instrument on your panel. It displays the true relationship of the airplane to the horizon at all times. Now, if we want to climb, we'd merely pull the nose up above the horizon like this. To descend, we'd ease the nose over slightly below the horizon like this. I see. Now, if we wanted to turn left, we could roll into a 30-degree bank like this. Now, we're in a left turn. To make our flight more realistic here in the simulator, Bill, we can talk to the tower and approach control to get navigational weather information and also to get radar vectors. Well, since this is a simulated flight, the radio operator is sitting outside right in back of us. That's right, Bill. Let me show you how it works. I'm tuning Denver approach control now. Denver approach control, United Trainer 7271, over the Denver VOR at 11,000, requesting vectors for an ILS approach to runway 26 left at Denver. Go ahead. All right, United 7271, uh, turn left heading 070, descend and maintain 7,000 feet. Radar vectors, ILS 26 left approach. Roger to left turn 070, descend to maintain 7. We're out of 11,000, and request your present weather, please. All right, United 7271, local weather now reporting ceiling 200 over gas, visibility is 1 mile, wind is light, variable from the west, altimeter 3005. 3005 on the altimeter. Roger weather. Thank you. One of the most important functions of the simulator is that the pilot can be trained to cope with any conceivable abnormal situation that might arise. During an actual lesson with pilots in training, the instructor uses a problem panel. By pushing any of these buttons, he can produce the actual conditions of any problem situation he wishes. 40 flap card. Up to me up. Cabin pressure controller set. We have a fire in engine number three. Silence the bell. Dawn is called for a simulated engine fire. Number three, throttle idle. Start lever cutoff. 
Essential power. Operating source. Fire switch pull. Discharge button push. Advise approach control. Request the equipment standing by. Number one for the approach and the latest Denver weather. Engine fire checklist. Thrust lever. Idle. Start lever cut off. Cut off. Essential power selector on operating generator. Operating That's generator. Set. Engine fire switch. Pull. Pull. Fire warning light remains on. Bottle discharge switch push. Light is out and a bottle is discharged. Checklist completed. Roger. A pumps off. If the instructor wants to discuss some of the details of a problem with the pilot right at that moment, there's one thing he can do in the simulator that you could never do in an actual flight. Let me freeze the simulator for a moment. We'll discuss this. The flight is held right at that point until the problem is cleared up. How are you going to get your landing gear down? Well, we'll crank it down manually. Uh, real good. I'll unfreeze you now, Dan, and we'll be on the way. You can see why jet simulator training is so valuable in preparing pilots, giving them the skills and confidence to handle an actual aircraft without ever leaving the ground. We're going to see how this training is put to use when we take a flight on a real 727 jetliner in just a minute. What's it like flying one of these huge jets? We're going on board this big 727 to watch an actual flight lesson in the air. The second officer is completing his ground check of the airplane. And our instructor, Don McGann, is getting on board now with the pilot. They've just come from a briefing session, and the flight plan has been filed with the tower. This is a regular 727 jetliner. The only difference is no passengers are permitted on a training flight, except for us today. Let's go up forward and watch. say rotate when the pilot should begin to lift the nose. Rotate. There's a warning device to let the pilot know that he may be flying too slowly and approaching a stall. It's called the stick shaker because it actually vibrates or shakes the control stick in the pilot's hand. Check in the stick shaker. Stick shaker's check. Yeah. 218, bug set. Flaps fine. Flaps two. Flaps going to two. Pressure checked. 
Hydraulic pneumatic brakes normal. Autopilot switches. Disengage. Jack less completed. Flaps are 25. I'd go right to 40 now. Flaps 40. Flaps 40. Go backwards, Ben. Stall thrust. Stall thrust. And Denver Center, United Trainer, 711. Block 1514, you'll turn here in. Reference speed. 110. They're coming back. 100 knots. Take off bar. Take off bar. Flaps 25. Flaps 25. He's wearing a 7-11 cut. Positive brake, gear up. Notice that airspeed decrease as mm -hmm. the doors come open. Point to On this white card, the second officer has given the pilot the correct airspeed for a safe landing, determined by the actual weight of the plane and the current weather conditions. Altimeter is 3011. Turning the outer marker on mine, identify it. Next, Don McGann is going to ask the pilot to fly an ILS, an instrument approach. The hood the pilot has been wearing will be down for this practice approach to a landing so that he can't look out at the ground but can see only the instrument panel in front of him. And uh, as you cross your 257, you'll be six north. That's a pretty good place to tune your ILS. Three zero zero. Thousand above the field. Flight is Miss Jack. That tiny black line up ahead is the runway that we're going to land on. Right turn on. 
pilot was able to handle this 727 jet as skillfully as he did because of the extensive, careful training methods we've seen today. Aviation has come a long way in the past 30 years. But what about the next 30 years? Our modern jets of today, which towered over that 1936 Stearman biplane, may look just as small and old-fashioned by comparison with aircraft now being planned for the future. Very soon now, we'll be seeing the birth of the SST, the supersonic jet transport, able to fly at speeds faster than sound. You can get an idea of the size of the plane by comparing it with the people. For crowded airports and smaller cities, this vertical takeoff jet transport may be one answer to the problem of congestion. It'll be able to rise vertically like a helicopter and then tilt its engines to fly horizontally. It's not as far off as you might think. The first SST is supposed to be flying by 1970. Then you'll be able to fly across the country in one hour, coast to coast. It promises to be an exciting future. We'll be back in just a minute. In 1903, when the Wright brothers made their historic first flight, people might have said you were crazy if you predicted jet liners like this flying today. But there are no limits, really, to man's imagination. Even now, the aviation planners are talking about intercontinental rocket transports will fly at 15,000 miles an hour, 10 minutes from New York to Los Angeles. How'd you like to pilot one of those? Well, who knows? Perhaps you will. Be sure to join us next week for another exciting Discovery program. See you then. The Discovery Production Unit's domestic transportation arrangements and production consideration provided by United Airlines. This has been a Jules Power production in association with ABC News and Public Affairs.